Here is Your Faith is Your Fortune by Neville Goddard. Chapter 1. Before Abraham was, I am. John 8.58. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the unconditioned consciousness of being, and the unconditioned consciousness of being conditioned itself by imagining it was something, and the unconditioned consciousness of being became what it had imagined. Thus began creation according to this law. First conceive, then become what is conceived. All things evolve from non-being, and without this consequence nothing is made. Before Abraham or the world existed, I am. When all time ceases to be, I am. I am the formless consciousness of being conceiving itself as man. By my eternal law of being, I am compelled to be and express all that I believe to be. I am the eternal void containing within it the capacity to be all things. I am that within which all my conceptions of myself live and move, and outside of which they are not. I dwell within every conception of myself. From this interiority, I forever seek to transcend all conceptions of myself by my own law of being, transcending my conceptions of myself only to the extent that I believe in that which transcends. I am the law of being, and there is no law beside me. I am that which is. Chapter 2 You shall also decree a thing, and it shall be established for you, and the light shall shine upon your ways. Job 22, 28. So shall my word be that goes forth out of my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. Isaiah 55, 11. Man can decree a thing, and it will come to pass. Man has always decreed what appeared in his world. Today, he decrees what appears in his world, and he will continue to do so as long as man is conscious of being man. Man commands things to appear with his words, which most often are a confession of his doubts and fears. Decrees are always made in consciousness. Every man automatically expresses what he is conscious of being, without effort or use of words. At every moment man commands himself to be and to possess what he is conscious of being and possessing. This is an immutable principle of expression that is staged in all the Bibles of the world. The authors of our sacred books were enlightened mystics, ancient masters of the art of psychology. In telling the story of the soul, they personified this impersonal principle in the form of historical document, both to preserve it and to hide it from the eyes of the uninitiated. Today, those to whom this great treasure has been entrusted, namely the priests of the world, have forgotten that the Bibles are psychological dramas representing man's consciousness in his blind forgetfulness. Now they teach their followers to worship their characters as men and women who truly lived in time and space. When man sees the Bible as a great psychological drama, with all its characters and actors as personified qualities and attributes of his own consciousness, then and only then will the Bible reveal to him the light of its symbolism. This impersonal principle of life that made all things is personified as God, this Lord God, creator of heaven and earth, is discovered as the consciousness of the human being. If man were less attached to orthodoxy and were more intuitively observant, he could not help but notice in the reading of the Bibles that the consciousness of being is revealed hundreds of times throughout this literature. To name a few, I am that I am sent me unto you, Exodus 3.14, be still and know that I am God, Psalm 46.10, I am the Lord and there is none else, there is no God beside me, Isaiah 45.5. I am the Lord your God, and there is none else, Joel 2.27. I am the Good Shepherd. The Good Shepherd giveth his life for the sheep, John 10.11. I am the Good Shepherd, and know my sheep, and am known of mine, John 10.14. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved, and shall go in and out, and find pasture, John 10.9. Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep, John 10, 7. I am the resurrection and the life, John 11, 25. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me, John 14, 6. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, saith the Lord, 
which is, and which was, and which is to come, the Almighty. Revelation 18. I am the unconditioned consciousness of the human being, revealing itself as the Lord and Creator of every conditioned state of being. If man would abandon his belief in a God apart from himself, he would recognize his consciousness of being as God. Consciousness molds itself in the likeness of its self-conception. It will transform its world from a barren desert to a fertile field according to its will. The day when man does this, he will know that he and his father are one, but that his father is greater than he. He will understand that his consciousness of being is one with what he is conscious of being, but that his unconditioned consciousness of being is greater than his conditioned state or self-conception. When man discovers that his consciousness is the impersonal power of expression, whose power is eternal, I personified in his self-conceptions, he will assume and appropriate that state of consciousness he wishes to express. In doing so, he will become that state in expression. You shall decree a thing, and it shall come to pass. Chapter 3. The Principle of Truth You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. John 8.32 The truth that sets man free is the knowledge that his consciousness is the resurrection and the life, that his consciousness resurrects and gives life to all that he is conscious of being. When man abandons his belief in a God apart from himself, and begins to recognize that his consciousness of being is God, as Jesus and the prophets did, he will transform his world by understanding that I and my Father are one. But my Father is greater than me. He will know that his consciousness is God, and what he is conscious of being is the Son, bearing witness to God the Father. Where the designer and the design are one, but the designer is greater than the design. Before Abraham was, I am. Yes, I was conscious of being before being conscious of being a man. And the day I cease to be conscious of being a man, I will continue to be conscious of being. Consciousness of being depends on nothing. It preceded all self-conceptions and will be when our self-conceptions have ceased to be. I am the beginning and the end, meaning all things or self-conceptions begin and end in me. But I am informed consciousness. I remain forever. Jesus discovered this glorious truth and declared himself one with God, not with the God that man had created, for he never recognized such a God. Jesus found that God was his consciousness of being, which is why he told man that the kingdom of God and heaven were within him, Luke 17, 21 to 23. When it is recorded that Jesus left the world and ascended to his Father, that he was received into heaven, Mark 16, 19, Luke 14, 51, it simply means he turned his attention away from the world of the senses and rose in consciousness to the level he wished to express. He remained there until he became one with the consciousness he ascended to. When he returned to the world of men, he could act with the positive assurance of what he was conscious of being, a state of consciousness that no one else felt or possessed. The man who is ignorant of this eternal law of expression regards such events as miracles. Rising in consciousness to the level of what one desires, and staying there until that level becomes your nature, is the path of all apparent miracles. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. John 12, 32. If I raise my consciousness to the naturalness of what I desire, I will attract the manifestation of that desire to me. The nature of manifestation is determined by the state of consciousness in which I dwell. I am always attracting my world, what I am conscious of being. If you are dissatisfied with your current expression of life, then you must be born again, John 3, 7. To be born again is to forsake the level with which you are dissatisfied and risk to the level of consciousness you want to express and possess. Unable to serve two masters, Matthew 6 to 24, Luke 16, 13, by withdrawing your attention from one state and putting it into another, you die to the one you abandoned and live and express the one you are united with. Man cannot see how it would be possible to express what he wants to be by a law as simple as acquiring the consciousness of the desired thing. One of the first things man must understand is that it is impossible, in dealing with this spiritual law of consciousness, to put new wine into old bottles or new patches onto old clothes. That is to say, 
You cannot carry some of your current consciousness into the new state because the sought-after state is complete in itself and requires no amendments. Every level of consciousness automatical Y expresses itself. Rising to the level of any state automatical Y means becoming that state in expression. To ascend to the level you are not currently expressing, you must completely abandon the consciousness with which you are currently identified. Do not be disheartened. This abandonment of your current identity is not as difficult as it might seem. The invitation from Scripture to be absent from the body and present with the Lord, 2 as Corinthians 5, 8, 5 3, is not directed to a few chosen ones, but is a broad call to all humanity. The body you are invited to leave is your current conception of yourself with all its limitations, whereas the Lord you must be present with is your consciousness of being. To achieve this seemingly impossible feat, divert your attention from your problem and place it in the simple act of being. Silently but confidently say, I am. This feeling of I am does not condition that consciousness. Simply continue to silently declare I am until you feel yourself floating. Floating is a psychological state that completely negates the physical. By practicing relaxation and voluntary refusal to react to sensory impressions, it is possible to develop a state of consciousness of pure receptivity. It is an amazingly easy realization in this state of complete detachment. A definite singleness of thought with purpose can be indelibly etched into your unmodified consciousness. This state of consciousness is necessary for true meditation. This wonderful experience of rising and floating is the sign that you are absent from the body or the problem and are now present with the Lord. In this expanded state, you are conscious of being nothing other than I am. Once this expression of consciousness is attained, within this formless depth of yourself, or things seem divinely possible. All that you sincerely feel while in this expanded state eventual, I becomes your natural expression over time. God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, Genesis 1-6. Yes, let there be firmness or conviction in the midst of this expanded consciousness by knowing and feeling, I am that, the desired thing. By claiming and feeling that you are the desired thing, you crystallize that liquid and formless light which you are in the image and likeness of what you are conscious of being. Now that the law of your being has been revealed to you, start from this day to change your world by revaluing yourself. For too long man has steadfastly held on to the belief that he is born in pain and must work for his salvation with the sweat of his brow. God is impersonal and is not partial to persons. As long as man continues to walk in this belief of pain, he will walk in a world of pain and confusion. The world in every detail is crystallized consciousness of man. In the book of Numbers it is recorded, we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so we were in their sight. Numbers 13.33 Today is the day, the eternal now, where the world's conditions have taken on the appearance of giants. The unemployed enemy armies, commercial competition, etc., are the giants that make you feel like a defenseless grasshopper. We were first in our own eyes helpless grasshoppers, and due to this self-conception, we were powerless grasshoppers to the adversary. We can only be for others what we are for ourselves. By revaluing yourself and beginning to feel like the giant, a center of power, you automatical why change your relationship with the giants, bringing these former monsters to their rightful place, making them appear as powerless grasshoppers. Paul stated about this principle, to the Greeks, or those colored wise in the world, it is a need, and to the Jews, or those seeking signs, it is an obstacle. We preach Christ crucified. To the Jews, he is a stumbling block, and to the Gentiles, foolishness, but to those who are Kal ed both Jews and Gentiles, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. 1 Corinthians 1.22.25 the day when man discovers and accepts this principle as the foundation of his life, on that day, man will kill his belief in a God other than himself. The story of Jesus' betrayal in the Garden of Gethsemane is the perfect illustration of man's discovery of this principle. We are told that the crowd armed with staves and lanterns sought Jesus in the darkness of the night. When they asked where Jesus was, the voice replied, I am. 
Then the entire crowd fell to the ground, regaining composure. They again asked to see the Saviour's hiding place, and again the Saviour said, I told you, I am. Jesus discovered this glorious truth when he declared, I and my Father are one, but my Father is greater than I. John 10.30, John 14.28 The power conceiving itself as man is greater than its conception. Our conceptions are limitations of the one conceiving them. Before Abraham was, I am, John 8.58. Before the world was, I am. Consciousness precedes our manifestations and is the support on which our manifestation rests. To eliminate manifestations, all that is required of you, the conceiving one, is to divert your attention from the conception. Rather than being out of sight, out of mind, the manifestation will remain in view as long as it draws the strength that the conceiving I am initial why gave it to manifest. This applies to our creation from the infinitely small electron to the infinitely large universe. Be still and know that I am God, Psalm 46.10. Yes, that same I am, your consciousness of being is God, the only God. I am is the Lord, the God of all flesh, all manifestation. This presence, your unconditional consciousness, knows no beginning or end. Limitations exist only in the manifestation. When you realize that this consciousness is your eternal being, you will know that before Abraham was, I am. Beginning to understand why you were told, Go and do likewise, Luke 10.37. Start now to identify with this presence, your consciousness, as the only reality. All manifestations are mere appearances. You, as a man, have no other reality than your eternal being, I am. Believe in what you claim to be. Who do you say that I am? Matthew 16.15, Mark 8.29, Luke 9.20. This is not a question asked 2,000 years ago. It is the eternal question addressed to the manifestation by the conceiving your true self, your current consciousness of being. Who do you think your consciousness is? This answer can only be defined from within, independently of the influence of others. Our I am, your true self, is not interested in man's opinion. All its interest lies in your conviction of yourself. What do you say about the I am and within you? You can answer and say, I am the Christ. Your response or level of understanding will determine the place it occupies in your life. Do you say or believe yourself to be a man of a certain family, race, nation, etc.? Do you sincerely believe this of yourself? Then life, your true being, will bring forth these conceptions into your world, and you will live with them as if they were real. I am the door, John 10.9. I am the way, John 14.6. I am the resurrection and the life. John 11.25 No one comes to the Father except through me. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. John 14.6 The I am, your consciousness, is the only door through which everything can pass into your world. Stop seeking signs. Signs fall out. They do not proceed. Begin to invest in the affirmation, seeing is believing because believing is seeing. Start believing now, not with hesitant confidence based on misleading external evidence, but with unwavering confidence based on the unchanging law that you can be what you desire to be. You will discover that you are not a victim of destiny, but a victim of your faith. Only through a door can what you seek pass into the world of manifestation. I am the door. Your consciousness is the door. Thus you must be conscious of being and having what you desire to be and have, any attempt to realize your desires other than through the door of consciousness makes you a thief and an assailant of yourself. Any expression not felt is against nature. Before something appears, I am feels itself as the desired thing, and then the felt thing appears, is resurrected, lifted from nothingness. I am rich, poor, healthy, sick, free or confined, were first impressions and felt conditions before becoming visible expressions. Your world is your objectified consciousness. Don't waste time trying to change the exterior. Change the interior or the impression, and the exterior or the expression will take care of itself. When the truth of this affirmation faileth upon you, you'll know you've found the lost word or the key to every door. I am consciousness is the lost magical word that became flesh 
in the likeness of what you're conscious of being. I am right now covers you, reader, my living temple, with my presence, urging you into a new expression. Your desires are my spoken words, my words are spirit and are true, and will not return to me empty but will accomplish what they were sent for. So shall my word be that goes forth out of my mouth, it shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it, Isaiah 55, 11. They are not something to manufacture, they are adornments worn by me, your faceless and formless being. See me clothed in your desire. I am at the door, your consciousness, and I call. If today it's my voice and you open to me, you'll recognize me as your Savior. I will enter you and I will sup with you and you with me. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. Revelation 3.20 how will my words be fulfilled? Your desires are not your concern. My words have a way you don't know, John 4.32. His ways cannot be discovered, Romans 11.33. All that is required of you is to believe. Believe that your desires are the adornments worn by your Saviour. Your belief that you are now what you wish to be is proof of your acceptance of life's gifts. You've opened the door for your Lord, dressed in your desire, to enter. The moment you establish this belief when you pray, believe that you've received, and it shall be so. Mark 11.24 All things are possible to him who believes. Mark 9.23 Make possible the impossible through your belief, and the impossible, for others, will manifest in your world. All men have had proof of the power of faith. Faith that moves mountains is faith in oneself. He who lacks self-confidence lacks faith in God. Your faith in God is measured by your confidence in yourself. I and my Father are one, John 10.30. Man and his God are one. Consciousness and manifestation are one. And God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, Genesis 1.6. In the midst of all doubts and changing opinions of others, let there be conviction, firm belief, and you'll see the dry land of your belief appear. The reward is for the one who endures to the end, but he who endures to the end will be saved. Matthew 24, 13 A conviction is not a conviction if it can be shaken. Your desire will be like clouds without rain if you don't believe in your unconditional consciousness. I am. The Virgin Mary, who knew no man. Luke 1, 34 And yet, without the aid of man, she conceived and bore a son. Mary the unconditional consciousness desired and then became conscious of being the conditioned state she wanted to express, and in a manner unknown to others she became that. Go and do likewise. Assume the consciousness of what you want to be, and you too will give birth to your Saviour. When the Annunciation occurs, when the impulse, the desire, is within you, believe it to be God's Word seeking to embody through you. Go, tell no one this holy thing you've conceived, Enclose your secret within and magnify the Lord. Magnify or believe that your desire is your Saviour, that it comes to be with you. When this belief is firmly established to the point where you feel confident in the results, your desire will manifest. No one knows how it will happen. Your desires have ways you don't know, John 4.32. My ways are unsearchable, Romans 11.33. Your desire can be likened to a seed, and seeds contain within themselves both the power and plan for self-expression. In other words, in him there is neither Greek nor Jew, slave nor free, male nor female. All these things are conceptions or limitations of the limitless, and therefore names of the unnameable. To feel that you are something is to ask the named me to express that name. Nature, ask what you will in my name, by appropriating the nature of the desired thing, and I will give it to you. Chapter 6. I am the why. If you do not believe that I am, you will die in your sins. John 8.24. All things were made by him, and without him, nothing that was made was made. John 13. This is a hard statement for those who have been trained in various orthodox religious systems, but it is so. All things, good, bad, or indifferent, have been made by God. God made man in his image and likeness. Genesis 1.27 Adding apparently to this confusion, it is stated, And God saw that his creation was good. Genesis 
What will he do with this apparent anomaly? How will man correlate all things as good when what is taught to him denies this fact? Either the understanding of God is wrong, or there is something fundamentally wrong in man's teaching. To the pure, all things are pure. Titus 1.15 This is another perplexing statement. All good, pure and holy people are the greatest prohibitionists. If we combine this previous statement with this one, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not according to the flesh but according to the Spirit. Romans 8.1 We will get an insurmountable barrier for the self-proclaimed judges of the world. These statements mean nothing to the Pharisaic judges, who blindly change and destroy shadows, continuing to firmly believe they are improving the world. Man, unaware that his world is his individualized consciousness, futilely strives to conform to others' opinions, instead of adjusting to the only existing opinion, namely his own judgment of himself. When Jesus discovered that his consciousness was this wonderful law of self-government, he declared, And now I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. John 17:19. He knew that consciousness was the only reality, that objectified things were nothing more than different states of consciousness. Jesus warned his disciples to first seek the kingdom of heaven, that state of consciousness that would produce the desired thing, and our things would be added unto them. Matthew 6:33. He also stated, I am the truth. John 14 to 6. He knew that man's consciousness was the truth or the cause of everything man saw as his world. Jesus realized that the world was made in the image of man. He knew that man saw his world as it was because man was as he was. In summary, man's conception of himself determines what he sees in his world. All things were made by God, consciousness, and without him, nothing was made. John 13. Creation is judged good and very good because it is the perfect likeness of that consciousness which produced it. To be conscious of being something, and then see oneself expressing something different from what one is conscious of, is a violation of the law of being. Therefore, it would not be good. The law of being never breaks. Man always sees himself expressing what he is conscious of being, whether good, bad, or indifferent. Yet it is a perfect likeness of his conception of himself. It is good, and very good. Not only are all things made by God, not. Only are all things made by God, all are descendants of God. God is one. Things or divisions are projections of the one. Being God, one must ordain oneself to be the apparent other, for there is no other. The absolute cannot contain within itself something that is not itself, otherwise it would not be absolute. Orders to be effective must be for oneself. I am that I am is the only effective order. I am the Lord, and there is no one else but me. Isaiah 45-5, Joel 2-27 You cannot ordain what is not, as there is no other. You must ordain yourself to be what you want to appear. Let me clarify what I mean by the effective order. It is not a repetition like a parrot of the affirmation, I am that I am. Such a repetition would be vain and stupid. It is not the words that make the order effective. It is the consciousness of being the thing that makes it effective. When you say I am, you declare that you are the word. In the statement I am, the I am indicates what you would be. The second I am in the quote is the cry of victory. All this drama unfolds within, with or without the use of words. Remain still and know that you are. This stillness is attained by observing the observer. Repeat softly but with feeling, I am, I am until you have lost all consciousness of the world and know yourself only as being the consciousness. Knowing that you are is Almighty God. Once that is accomplished, define yourself as being what you desire to be, feeling to be the desired thing. I am that. This understanding that you are the desired thing will evoke an emotion throughout your entire being. When the conviction is established and you truly believe to be what you desired to be, then the second I am is pronounced as a cry of victory. This mystical revelation of Moses can be seen as three distinct steps. I am, I am free, I am truly. Regardless of the appearances around you, ill things yield to the coming of the Lord. I am the Lord who comes in the appearance of what I am consciously aware of being. 
all the inhabitants of the earth cannot stop my coming or challenge my authority to be what I am conscious of being. All the inhabitants of the earth are nothing in comparison, and he does according to his will in the armies of heaven and among all the inhabitants of the earth. And no one can say to him, What are you doing? Daniel 4.35 I am the light of the world. John 8.12 crystallizing in the form of my conception of myself. Consciousness is the eternal light that crystallizes only through the conception you have of yourself. Change your conception of yourself and you will automatically change the world in which you live. Do not try to change people. They are merely messengers telling you who you are. Rise above and they will confirm the change. Now you will understand why Jesus sanctified himself instead of others. John 17:19. Why for the pure all things are pure, Titus 1.15, why in Christ Jesus, the awakened consciousness, there is no condemnation, Romans 8.1. Wake up from the sleep of condemnation and experience the principle of life. Stop judging others and condemning yourself. Listen to the revelation of the enlightened. I know and am persuaded by the Lord Jesus Christ that there is nothing unclean of itself, but to him who sees something as unclean, to him it is unclean. Romans 14.14. 14. And again, blessed is the man who does not condemn himself for what he allows. Romans 14.22. Stop wondering if you are worthy or unworthy to claim what you want to be. You will be condemned by the world only as long as you condemn yourself. You have nothing to achieve. The works are finished. The principle by which all things are made, and without which nothing is made, is eternal. You are that principle. Your consciousness of being is that eternal law. You have never expressed something of which you were not conscious and you never will. Assume the consciousness of what you want to express. Claim it until it becomes a natural manifestation. Feel it and live with that feeling until it becomes your nature. Here is a simple formula. Withdraw your attention from your current conception of yourself and place it in that ideal, your ideal that you previously thought was out of your reach. Affirm that you are that ideal, not as something you will become over time, but as what you are in the immediate present. Do it, and your current world of limitations will disintegrate as your new claim emerges like a phoenix from the ashes. Fear not, be not daunted by this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Chronicles 2015. Do not struggle against your problem. Your problem will live only as long as you are conscious of it. Turn your attention away from your problem and the many reasons why you cannot reach your ideal. Focus your attention entirely on the desired thing. Abandon everything and follow me. Matthew 8.22, Luke 5.27 In the face of seemingly mountainous obstacles, claim your freedom. Consciousness of freedom is the father of freedom. It has a way of expressing itself that no one knows. You will not have to fight in this battle. Stand, be still and see the salvation of the Lord with you. Chronicles 20.17 I am the Lord, I am. In parentheses, your consciousness is the Lord. The consciousness that the thing is done, that the work is finished, is the Lord of every situation. Listen carefully to the promise. You will not have to struggle in this battle. Stand, be still, and see the salvation of the Lord with you. This particular consciousness with which you identify yourself is the Lord of the agreement. It will alone accomplish what has been agreed upon on earth. Faced with the army of reasons why something cannot be done, you can make a quiet agreement with the Lord for it to happen. Now that you have found the Lord as your consciousness of being, be aware that the battle is won. Even if the enemy seems close and threatening, continue with your confidence by remaining still, knowing that victory is yours. If you can see, you will see the salvation of the Lord. Remember that the reward is for those who endure, Matthew 24, 13. Stay still, Psalm 46, 10. To stay still is the deep conviction that everything is well, that everything is done, no matter what you hear or see. You remain unshaken, aware that ultimately you will be victorious. All things are done by such agreements, and without such an agreement, nothing is done, John 13. I am that I am, Exodus 3.14. In the Revelation, it is said that a new heaven and a new earth will appear, 21 to 1, to John, to whom this vision was shown, he was told to write, It is done, 21.6. Heaven is your consciousness, and earth is its solidified state, 
So accept as John did, it is done. All that is required of you to seek a change is to rise to the level of what you desire without stopping at the form of expression. Note that this is done by feeling the naturalness of being that. Here is an analogy that might help you see this mystery. Imagine you enter a movie theater just as the film ends. All you saw of the movie was the happy ending as you wanted to see the complete story. You waited for it to unfold again with the anticlimactic sequence. The hero appears accused, surrounded by false evidence, all to draw tears from the audience, but you, sure of knowing the ending, remain calm, knowing that regardless of the apparent direction of the scene, the end is already set. Likewise, see through to what you are seeking, witness the happy ending, consciously feeling that you are expressing and possessing what you want to express and possess, and through faith, understand and in the end, have the confidence born of this knowledge. This knowledge will sustain you during the time needed for the evolution of the Imagi. Do not ask for help from man, feel that it is done, by consciously affirming that you are now what man hopes to be. Chapter 7. The will be done, not mine. Luke 22.42. My father, if this cup cannot pass away from me unless I drink it, thy will be done. Matthew 26.42. But not what I want, but what thou wants. Mark 14.36. This resignation is not a blind understanding that I cannot do anything by myself. The Father in me, he does the work. I can do nothing by myself. John 5.30. Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and that the Father is in me? The words I speak to you are not from myself, but the Father who resides in me, he does the works. John 14.10. When man tries to bring forth in time and space something that does not exist now, too often, we are not aware of what we are actual, I doing. Unconsciously, we affirm that we do not possess the abilities to express. We preach our desire in hopes of gaining the necessary. Capabilities in the future. I am not, but I will be. Man does not realize that consciousness is the father who does the work. Therefore, he tries to express what he is not conscious of being. These struggles are doomed to fail. Only the present expresses itself. If I am not conscious of being what I am seeking, I will not find it. God, your consciousness, is the substance and the fuelness of everything. The will of God is the recognition of what is, not of what will be. Instead of considering this statement as, Thy will be done, rather consider it as, Thy will be done. The works are finished, the principle by which all things become visible is eternal. The eye has not seen, the ear has not heard, and it has not entered into the heart of man what God has prepared for those who love him, Corinthians 2, 9-10. When a sculptor looks at a shapeless piece of marble, he sees buried within its formless mass his finished artwork. The sculptor, instead of creating his masterpiece, merely reveals it by removing the part of the marble that hides his conception. Similarly, in your consciousness, everything you conceive already lies buried. Recognizing this truth will transform you from an inexperienced worker trying to make it so into a great artist who acknowledges that it is so. Your affirmation that you are now what you want to be will lift the veil of human darkness and perfectly reveal your affirmation, I am that. The will of God was expressed in the words of the widow, It is well. The will of man would have been, I will be well. To affirm I will be well is to say I am sick. God the Eternal does not mock words or vain repetitions. God continuously embodies what is so. The surrender of Jesus, who became like God, was to shift from recognizing the deprivation indicated by the future, I will be, to recognizing the fulfillment by affirming, I am that. It is done. Thank you, Father. Now you will see the wisdom in the prophet's words when he affirms that the weak says, I am strong, Joel 3.10. Man, in his blindness, does not heed the prophet's counsel and continues to affirm that he is weak, poor, unhappy, and all the other undesirable expressions from which he tries to free himself by ignorantly affirming that he will be free from these characteristics in anticipation of the future. Such thoughts oppose the only law that can set him free. There is only one door through which what you seek can enter your world, 
I am the door, John 10, 9. When you say, I am, you declare in the first person, in the present tense, there is no future. To know that I am is to be conscious of being. Consciousness is the only door. If you are not conscious of being what you are seeking, you seek in vain. If you judge by appearances, you will remain enslaved by the evidence of your senses. To break this hypnotic spell of the senses, you are told, enter and shut the door. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is there, in secret, and your Father, who sees in secret, will reward you openly. Matthew 6.6 6. Enter into your chambers and shut your doors behind you. Hide yourself for a little moment until the indignation passes. Isaiah 26.20 When you enter, shut the door behind you and behind your children. 2 Kings 4.4 4. The door of the senses must be properly closed before your new claim can be heard. Closing the door of the senses is not as difficult as it appears at first. It is effortless. It is impossible to serve two masters at once. The master that man serves is what he is conscious of. I am the Lord and the master of what I am conscious of being. No effort is needed for me to conjure poverty if I am conscious of being poor. My servant, poverty, is obliged to follow me by being conscious of poverty. Rather than struggling against the evidence of the senses, affirm that you are what you wish to be. By focusing your attention on this affirmation, the doors of the senses' automatical eye shut against your old master, that which you were conscious of. As you lose yourself in the feeling of being what you now affirm is true of yourself, the doors of the senses open again, revealing that your world is the perfect expression of what you are conscious of being. Let us follow out the example of Jesus, who realized that as a man he could do nothing to change his current image of lack. He closed the door of his senses against his problem and turned to his. Father, the one for whom all things are possible. Denying the evidence of his senses, he affirmed to be everything that his senses had told him. A moment earlier, he was not. Knowing that consciousness expresses its likeness on earth, he remained in the claimed consciousness until the doors of his senses opened and confirmed the governance of the Lord. Remember that I am, is the Lord of all. Do not reuse the will of man that affirms I will be. Be as resigned as Jesus and affirm I am that. Chapter 8 there is no other God, I am the first and I am the last, and beside me there is no God. Isaiah 44, 6 I am the Lord, your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. Deuteronomy 5, 6, 7 As long as man believes in a power other than himself, he deprives himself of the being that he is. Any belief in powers external to himself, whether for good or for evil, will become the mold of the sculpted image that is worshipped. Beliefs in the power of medicine to heal, diets to strengthen, money to secure, are the changers or merchants that must be driven out of power. Matthew 21.12 You can then inevitably manifest this quality, this understanding, thus overturning the temple of the changers. You are the temple of the living God. 1 Corinthians 3.16 And what agreement does the temple of God have with idols? For you are the temple of the living God, as God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them, I will be their God, and they shall be my people. 2 Corinthians 6.16 A house made with hands is not made. It is written, My house shall be, Carl, at a house of prayer for all nations. But you have made it a den of thieves. Matthew 21.13 the thieves that steal from you are your own false beliefs. It's your belief in a thing, not the thing itself, that aids you. There is only one power, I am, and it is due to your belief in external things that you think the power is in them. Transferring the power that you are to the external thing, realize that you yourself are the power you wrongly gave to external conditions. The Bible compares the stubborn man to a camel that could not pass through the eye of a needle. Matthew 19.24 the eye of the needle referred to was a small gate in the wall-s of Jerusalem, so narrow that a camel could not pass through. Until he unloads himself, the rich man, that is, one burdened with false human concepts, cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Similarly, the camel could not pass through that small gate. Man feels so sure of his laws, opinions, and beliefs 
made by man, that he regards them as an authority they do not possess. Convinced that his knowledge is everything, he remains unaware that all external appearances are nothing more than externalized mental states. When he realizes that consciousness of a quality externalizes that quality without the aid of anything else or of many values, and that it establishes the only true value, his own consciousness. The Lord is in his holy temple, Habakkuk 2.20. Consciousness dwelleth in what it is conscious of. I am is the Lord, and man is his temple. Knowing that consciousness is objective, man must forgive all men for being what they are. He must realize that each one expresses without the aid of another what he is conscious of being. Peter, the educated or disciplined man, knew that a change of consciousness would produce a change of expression. Instead of sympathizing with the beggars of life at the temple gate, he declared, Silver and gold I do not have for you, but what I have, namely, the consciousness of freedom, I give to you. Acts 3, 6. Stir up the gift that is within you. 2 Timothy 1, 6. Stop begging and claim what you choose to be. Do this and you will also pass from your infirm world to the world of freedom, singing praises to the Lord. But he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. 1 John 4, 4. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. 1 John 4, 4. This is the cry of anyone who realizes that his consciousness of being is God. Your recognition of this fact will automatical. I cleanse the temple of your consciousness from thieves and assailants, giving you dominion over things that you lost the moment you forgot the commandment. You shall have no other gods before me. Exodus 20, C. 3. Let each one take heed how he builds upon it. 1 Corinthians 3.10 The foundation of our expression is consciousness. Despite Alman's efforts, he can find no cause of manifestation other than his consciousness of being. Man believes he has found the cause of disease in germs, the cause of war in conflicting political ideologies and greed. All these human discoveries, catalogued as the essence of wisdom, are absurd in the eyes of God. There is only one power, and that power is God. Consciousness kill s, makes alive, wounds, heals, makes all things good, bad, or indifferent. Man walks in a world that is nothing but his objectified consciousness, unknowingly. He struggles against his reflections, while keeping alive the light and images projected by these reflections. I am the light of the world. John 8.12 I am. Is consciousness, it is light. What I am aware of, my conception of myself as being rich, healthy, free, those are the images. The world is the mirror that amplifies everything I am aware of. Stop trying to change the world because it's only the mirror. Man's attempt to change the world by force is as futile as breaking a mirror, in hopes of changing his face. Leave the mirror and change your face. Leave the world and change your conception of yourself. Then, the reflection will be satisfying. Freedom or confinement, satisfaction or frustration, can only be differentiated by the consciousness of being. Irrespective of your problem, its duration or magnitude, careful attention to these instructions will, in a surprisingly short time, eliminate even the memory of the problem. Ask yourself this question, how would I feel if I were free? The moment you sincerely ask yourself this question, the answer comes, no man can tell another what the satisfaction of his fulfilled desire would feel like. This feeling and joy of automatic change of consciousness come in response to your self-questioning. This feeling, this emotion that comes to you in response to your self-questioning, that is the state of consciousness, the cornerstone upon which conscious change is built. No one knows how this feeling will embody, but it will. Consciousness has ways unknown to man. The degree of conviction entirely determines this. As doubts fade and you can feel, I am this, you begin to develop the fruit or nature of what you feel to be. When a person buys a hat or a new pair of shoes, they believe everyone knows they are new. They feel a little uncomfortable with their newly acquired clothing until it becomes a part of them. It's the same with the use of new states of consciousness. When you ask yourself the question, how would I feel if my desire were realized right now? 
the automatic response, until properly conditioned by time and use, is actual why disturbing. The process of adaptation to realize this potential of consciousness is akin to the newness of worn clothes, not knowing that consciousness always represents itself in the surroundings, like Lot's wife, you continually look back at your problem and again allow yourself to be hypnotized by its appearance of naturalness. Genesis 19. Listen to the words of Jesus. Leave everything behind and follow me. Let the dead bury their dead. Matthew 8.22, Luke 9.60. Your problem can hypnotize you to the extent of its apparent natural reality that you struggle to put on the new consciousness feeling of your Savior. You must assume this garment if you want results. The stone which the builders rejected, that is, they did not want to wear, became the cornerstone, and no other foundation can be laid. Chapter 10. To him who has it will be given, and from him who does not have, even what he seems to have will be taken away. Luke 8, 18. The Bible, the greatest book of psychology ever written, warns man that he must be aware of what he hears. It then follows this warning with the assertion that, to him who has it will be given, and from him who does not have, even what he seems to have will be taken away. Although many consider this assertion as one of the cruelest and most unfair among the statements attributed to Jesus, it is nonetheless a just and merciful law based on the immutable principle of life. Man's ignorance of how the law operates neither excuses him nor saves him from the results. The law is impersonal and therefore makes no distinction among individuals. Man is cautioned that he must be selective in what he hears and accepts as true. Everything man accepts as true leaves an impression on his consciousness and, over time, must define itself as proof or refutation. Perceptive hearing is the perfect means by which man records impressions. A man must discipline his ear to listen only to what he wants to hear, regardless of rumors or contrary evidence from his senses. As he conditions his perceptive hearing, he will only react to the impressions he has decided to accept. This law never fails entirely. Fully conditioned, man becomes incapable of hearing anything other than what contributes to his desire. God, as you have discovered, is that unconditional consciousness that gives you everything you are conscious of being. To be conscious of being or having something is to be or have what one is conscious of being. On this immutable principle, all things rest. It is impossible for anything to be other than what one is conscious of being. To him who has what he is conscious of being will be given, whether it be good, bad, or indifferent. No matter the man, he receives in double what he is conscious of being. In accordance with this immutable law, to him who has not, it will be taken away, and it will be added to him who has. The rich get richer and the poor get poorer. Only what one is conscious of being can be enlarged. All things gravitate toward the consciousness with which they are in harmony. Likewise, all things disintegrate from the consciousness with which they are not in harmony. Equitably divide the wealth of the world among all men, and in a short time this fair division will resemble the initial disproportion. Wealth will return to the pockets of those from whom it was taken away. Instead of joining the chorus of those who have not, and insist on destroying those who have, Recognize this immutable law of expression. Consciously define yourself as what you desire. Once your conscious claim is established, persist in that confidence until receiving the reward. With the same certainty as die foal ow's night, any attribute consciously claimed will manifest. While to the orthodox sleeping world this may seem like a cruel and unjust law, to the enlightened it is one of the most merciful and just declarations of truth. I have not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Matthew 5-17 Nothing is truly destroyed. All apparent destruction is the result of a change in consciousness. Consciousness always completely fulfill as the state in which it resides, and the state from which consciousness emanates appears destructive to those unfamiliar with this law. However, it is only preparatory to a new state of consciousness, Claim for yourself what you desire it to fulfill. Nothing is destroyed. Everything is fulfilled, Ed. To him who has, it will be given. Chapter 11. Christmas. Behold, a virgin shall be with child, 
and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Matthew 1.23 One of the most controversial assertions of the New Testament concerns the virgin conception and subsequent birth of Jesus, a conception in which man had nothing to do. It is recorded that a virgin conceived a child without man's aid and then bore it secretly and effortlessly. This is the foundation upon which all of Christianity rests. The Christian world is asked to believe in this story, for man must believe the incredible to fool he express the greatness that is scientifically impossible. Man might be inclined to reject the entire Bible as false because reason does not permit him to believe that virgin birth is physiologically possible. But the Bible is a message of the soul and must be interpreted psychological why if man is to discover its true symbolism. Man must see this story as a psychological drama rather than a statement of physical facts to discover that the Bible is based on a law that, if applied, will result in an expression manifesting beyond his wildest dreams of accomplishment. To apply this law of self-expression, man must be educated in belief and disciplined to stand on the platform that everything is possible to God. The most striking dramatic moments of the New Testament, namely the birth, death and resurrection of Jesus, were programmed and dated to coincide with certain astronomical phenomena. The mystics who recorded this story noticed that at certain seasons of the year, beneficial changes on earth corresponded to astronomical changes in the sky. In writing this psychological drama, they personified the story of the soul as the biography of man. By using these cosmic changes, they marked the birth and resurrection of Jesus to convey that the same beneficial changes occur, psychological why in man's consciousness, when he follows the law. Even for those who do not understand it, the Christmas story is one of the most beautiful ever told. When unfolded in the light of its mystical symbolism, it reveals itself as the true birth of our manifestation in the world. This virgin birth is supposed to have taken place on December 25th, or as celebrated by some secret societies on Christmas Eve, at midnight on December 24th. The mystics established this date to mark Jesus' birth because it was in harmony with the great earthly benefits that this astronomical change signified. The astronomical observations that led the authors of this drama to use these dates were all made in the Northern Hemisphere. Thus, from the astronomical viewpoint, the opposite would be true if seen from Southern latitudes. However, this story was recorded in the North and was therefore based on observations from the North. Man very quickly discovered that the sun played a crucial role in his life, that without the sun, physical life as he knew it could not exist. So these most important dates in the story of Jesus' life are based on the position of the sun as seen from earth in northern latitudes. After the sun reaches its highest point in the skies in June, it gradually descends towards the south, taking with it the life of the plant world, so that by December, Almost all of nature is at rest. If the sun continued to descend towards the south, all of nature would rest until death. However, on December 25th, the sun begins its grand movement towards the north, bringing with it the promise of salvation and new life for the world. Every day as the sun ascends in the skies, man gains confidence that he will be saved from cold and famine. Since you know that by moving northward and crossing the equator, Owl of nature will be reborn, resurrected from its long winter sleep. Our day is measured from midnight to midnight, and as the visible day begins in the east and ends in the west, the ancients said that the day was born from that constellation that occupied the eastern horizon at midnight. On Christmas Eve or at midnight on December 24th, the constellation of Virgo rises on the eastern horizon. Therefore, it is established that this sun and saviour of the world was born of a virgin. It is also established that this virgin mother traveled at night, stopped at an inn where the only available room was among the animals, and there, in a manger where the animals were fed, the shepherds found the holy child. The animals with which the holy virgin stayed are the sacred animals of the zodiac. There, in that circle of constantly moving astronomical animals, is the holy mother virgin, 
and there you will see her every midnight on December 24th, standing on the eastern horizon, as the Son and the Saviour of the world begin their journey northward. Psychological why this birth takes place in man, the day he discovers that his consciousness is the Son and the Saviour of his world. When man understands the significance of this mystical declaration, I am the light of the world, Matthew 5.14, John 8.12, he will realize that his I am or his consciousness is the sun of his life, radiating images on the screen of space. These images are akin to what he as a man is conscious of being. Thus, the qualities and attributes that appear to move on the screen of his world are actual why projections of this inner light. The countless unfulfilled hopes and ambitions of man are like seeds buried in man's consciousness or the virgin of man. They remain there like the seeds of the earth held in the frozen residues of winter, waiting for the sun to move northward, or for man to regain knowledge of who he is. In returning, he moves northward through the recognition of his true being, affirming, I am the light of the world. When man discovers that his consciousness or his I am is God, the saviour of his world, he will be like the sun in its journey northward. Our hidden impulses and ambitions will then be warmed and stimulated to be born by this knowledge of his true being. He will affirm what he has been waiting for all along without anyone's help. He will define himself as what he desires to express, discovering that his I am is the virgin conceiving without man's aid. Our conceptions of himself, when felt and anchored in consciousness, will easily embody as living realities in his world. Man will one day realize that all this drama takes place in his consciousness, that his unconditional consciousness, or his I am, is the Virgin Mary desiring to express itself. Through this law of self-expression, he defines himself as what he desires to express, and, without anyone's help or cooperation, expresses what he has consciously claimed and defined himself to be. Then he will understand why Chrismac is fixed on December 25th, while Easter is a movable date. Why all of Christianity rests on the Verin conception, that his consciousness is the Verin womb or the spouse of the Lord, receiving impressions as self-impregnation, and then embodying these impressions as expressions of his life. Chapter 12. Crucifixion and Resurrection. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. John 11.25. The mystery of the crucifixion and resurrection is so intertwined that to fully understand it they must be explained together, for one determines the other. This mystery is symbolized on earth in the rituals of Good Friday and Easter. You have noticed that the anniversary of this cosmic event announced each year by the Church is not a fixed date like other birthdays that mark births and deaths, but this day changes from year to year falling anywhere between March 22nd and April 25th. The day of the resurrection is determined in this way. The first Sunday after the full moon in Aries celebrates Easter. Aries begins on March 21st and ends around April 19th. The entry of the sun into Aries marks the beginning of spring. The moon, in its monthly transit around the earth, will at some point between March 21st and April 25th form an opposition to the sun an opposition Cal Ed the full moon. The first Sunday after this celestial occurrence is when Easter is celebrated. The Friday preceding this day is observed as Good Friday. This movable date should indicate to the observer to seek a different interpretation than the one general eye accepted. These days do not mark the anniversaries of the death and resurrection of an individual who lived on Earth. From Earth's perspective, the Sun, in its passage northward, appears in the spring season of the year. To cross the imaginary line that man Karl is the equator. Thus, mystics say, it was crossed or crucified so that man could live. It is significant that shortly after this event, all of nature begins to rise or resurrect from its long winter slumber. Therefore, it can be concluded that this disruption of nature at this season of the year is directly due to this crossing. Thus, it is believed that the sun must shed its blood at Easter. If these days marked the death and resurrection of a man, they would be fixed to foul on the same date each year like all other fixed historical events. But obviously, this is not the case. These dates were not intended to mark the anniversaries of Jesus' death and resurrection, 
The scriptures are psychological dramas and will only reveal their meaning when interpreted psychological why. These dates are adjusted to coincide with the cosmic change that occurs at this time of the year, marking the death of the previous year and the resurrection of the new year or spring. These dates symbolize the death and resurrection of the Lord, but this Lord is not a man. It is your consciousness of being. It is written that he gave his life so that you may live. I have come that they may have life, and that they may have it more abundantly, John 10.10. 10. Consciousness sacrifices itself by detaching from what it is conscious of to live what it desires to be. Spring is the time of year when mill ions of seeds that have been buried all winter in the ground suddenly burst forth so that man may live. And as the mystical drama of crucifixion and resurrection has the nature of this annual change, it is celebrated in this spring season of the year, but in reality it takes place at any time. To be crucified is your consciousness of being, the cross is your conception of yourself, the resurrection is the elevation to the visibility of this conception of yourself. Far from being a day of mourning, Good Friday should be a day of joy, because there can be no resurrection or expression without first a crucifixion or an impression. What needs to be resurrected in your case is what you desire to be. For this you must feel like the desired thing. You must feel, I am the resurrection and the life of desire. I am, in parentheses, your consciousness of being is the power that resurrects and makes alive what you desire to be in your consciousness. Two will agree to touch anything, and it shall be done for them by my Father who is in heaven, Matthew 18, 19. The two who agree are you and your consciousness, the consciousness desiring and the thing desired. When this agreement is reached, the crucifixion is complete. The two have crossed or intersected each other. I am, and that the consciousness and what you are conscious of being are united and become one. I am is now nailed or fixed in the belief that I am this fusion. Jesus or I am is nailed to the cross of that. The nail binding you to the cross is the nail of feeling. The mystical union is now consummated and the result will be the birth of a child or the resurrection of a son testifying of his father. Consciousness is united to what it is conscious of being. The world of expression is the sun confirming this union. The day you cease to be conscious of being what you are currently conscious of being, that day your son of expression will die and return to the bosom of his father, consciousness without face and form. All expressions are the result of these mystical unions. Thus the priests are right when they say that true marriages are made in heaven and can only be dissolved in heaven. But let me clarify this statement by telling you that heaven is not a place, it is a state of consciousness. The kingdom of heaven is within you, Luke 17, 21. In heaven, in parentheses consciousness, God is touched by what he is conscious of being. Who touched me? For I perceive that virtue has gone out of me, Luke 8, 45, 46. At the moment of this contact, in parentheses feeling, a offspring or an outgoing from me towards visibility takes place. The day when man feels I am free, I am rich, I am strong, God, in parentheses, I am, is touched or crucified by these qualities or virtues. The results of this touching or crucifixion will manifest in the birth or resurrection of the felt qualities, because man must have a visible confirmation of everything he is conscious of being. Now, you will understand why man or manifestation is always made in the image and likeness of God. Your consciousness imagines and represents everything you are conscious of being. I am the Lord, and apart from me there is no God. Isaiah 45, 56. I am the resurrection and the life. John 11, 25. You will fix the belief that you are what you desire to be before having the slightest visible proof of what you are. You will know by the deep conviction you have felt anchored within you that you are, and thus without waiting for the confirmation of your senses, you will cry out, It is finished, John 19.30. So, with a faith born from the knowledge of this unshakable law, you will be as dead and buried. You will be motionless, impassive in your conviction, and sure that you will resurrect the qualities that you have fixed and felt within you. The impressions and just as we have borne the image of the earthly 
we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. 1 Corinthians 15, 49. Your consciousness, or your I am, is the unlimited potential upon which impressions are made. Impressions are defined states pressed upon your I am. Your consciousness, or I am, can be likened to a photosensitive film. In its virgin state, it is potential Y unlimited. You can print or engrave on it a message of love or a hymn of hate, a wonderful symphony or discordant jazz. Regardless of the nature of the impression, your I am will receive it and will ingly hold it. Your consciousness is the one mentioned in Isaiah 53.37. Despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, we hid our faces from him, he was despised, and we did not esteem him. He bore our sorrows and endured our pains. We considered him stricken, struck by God, and afflicted. Yet he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brings us peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. Your unconditional consciousness is impersonal. It makes no distinction of persons, Acts 10.34, Romans 2.11. Without thinking or striving, it automatically expresses all the impressions that are recorded in it. It offers no resistance to any impression that falls upon it. Even though it is capable of receiving and expressing each and every defined state, it remains forever an immaculate and unlimited potential. Your I am is the foundation upon which the defined state or conception of yourself rests, but it is not defined by or dependent on these defined states to be. Your I am neither expands nor contracts, nothing modifies it, nor is anything added to it. Before any defined state comes into being, that is when all states cease to be. All defined states or conceptions of yourself are only ephemeral expressions of your eternal being. To be impressed is to be there, pressed. I am the first person, present tense. All expressions are the result of impressions. Only to the extent that you proclaim yourself as what you desire to be, will you express such desires so that all desires become impressions of qualities that are, not qualities that will be. Your I am in parentheses, your consciousness is God, and God is the fuel-ness of all that is eternal. Now is the accepted moment, 1 Corinthians 6, 2, Isaiah 49 to 8. The kingdom of heaven is at hand, Matthew 4, 17. I am, in parentheses, Jesus' salvation said, I am with you always, Matthew 28, 20. Your consciousness is the Savior who is always with you, but if you deny it, it will also deny you, Matthew 10, 33, Luke 12, 9. To deny it is to affirm that it will appear, as millions of people do today by asserting that salvation is yet to come. This is the same as saying that we are not saved. You must stop looking for your Savior to appear and start affirming that it is already saved, and the signs of your affirmations will follow. When the widow was asked what she had in her house, there was a recognition of substance. Her assertion was, a few drops of oil, 1 Kings 4.16. A few drops will turn into a stream if rightly claimed. Your consciousness magnifies all consciousness. To affirm that you will have oil, parentheses joy, is to confess you have empty measures. Such impressions of lack produce lack. Your consciousness, parentheses God makes no difference between persons, Acts 10.34, Romans 2.11. It is purely impersonal. This consciousness of all existence receives impressions, qualities, and attributes that define consciousness, namely your impressions. All your desires must be determined by need. Needs, whether apparent or real, will automatically be fulfilled, and when met with sufficient intensity of purpose as defined desires. Knowing that your consciousness is God, you must consider each desire as the spoken word of God telling you what it is. Leave aside the man whose breath is in his nostrils, for in what should he be accounted of? Isaiah 2.22 We are always what our consciousness defines, never claim I will be that. From now on, 
Our affirmations must be, I am that I am. Before asking, the solution to every problem associated with desire is obvious. Every problem automatical, I provokes the desire for a solution. Man is educated to believe his desires are things to struggle against. In his ignorance, he denies his savior who constantly knocks on the door of his consciousness to be let in. I am the door, he says. If your desire were fulfill ED, that would not save you from your problem. Letting your savior in is the easiest thing in the world. Things must be to be let in. You are conscious of a desire. The desire, though invisible, must be affirmed by you to become a reality. God calls the things which are not as though they were. Romans 4.17 By affirming I am the desired thing you, let in the Saviour. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and eat with him, and he with me. Revelation 3.20 Each desire is the Saviour's cowl at the door. Everyone hears this knock. Man opens the door when he affirms I am. Letting in your Saviour is the easiest thing in the world. Let the desired thing seize you until you feel pressed by the knowledge of your Saviour, then utter the cry of victory, it is finished. John 19.30 Chapter 14 Circumcision In whom you have also been circumcised, not with the circumcision made by hand, in stripping off the body of the sins of the flesh, but with the circumcision of Christ. Circumcision is the operation that removes the veil that hides the head of creation. The physical act has nothing to do with the spiritual act. Anyone can be physical why circumcised and yet remain impure and blind. To those spiritual why circumcised, the veil of darkness has been removed and in Christ, the light of the world is known. Let me now perform the spiritual operation in you, the reader. This act is accomplished on the eighth day after birth not because this day has any special significance or differs in any way from other days, but because it is done on this eighth day as eight is the number that has no beginning or end. Additional I, the ancient symbolized the eighth number or letter as an enclosure or a veil behind which the mystery of creation was buried. Thus the secret of the operation on the eighth day is in accordance with the nature of the act that reveals the eternal head of creation, this immutable element where all things begin and end, yet remains your eternal being when all things cease to be. This mysterious element is your consciousness of being. At this moment you are conscious of being, but you are also conscious of being someone. This someone is the veil that hides the being you actually are. First, you are conscious of being, then you are conscious of being a man. After the veil of man has been placed upon your faceless being, you become conscious of being a member of a particular race, a nation, a family, a belief, etc. The veil that must be lifted in the spiritual circumcision is the veil of man. But before doing so, attachments to race, nation, family, etc. must be cut off. In Christ there is neither Greek nor Jew, neither slave nor free, neither male nor female, a regeneration where there is no distinction between Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, Barbarian, Scythian, slave, free. But Christ is all and in all, Colossians 3.11. You must leave aside father, mother, brother, and follow my way. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father, mother, wife, children, brothers, and sisters, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Luke 14.26. To achieve this, you must stop identifying with these divisions by becoming indifferent to such assertions. Indifference is the knife that cuts feeling, it is the bond that unites. When you can regard man as one great brotherhood without distinction of race or belief, then you will know you have severed those attachments with these broken ties. All that separates you now from your true being is your belief of being a man. To remove this final veil, abandon your conception of yourself as a man, to know yourself simply as a being instead of the consciousness of I am the man. There is only I am, faceless, formless, and without figure. You are spiritual, I circumcised, when the consciousness of man is forsaken, and your unconditional consciousness of being reveals you as the eternal head of creation, a formless, faceless presence that knows all. Then, unveiled and awakened, you will proclaim and know that I am is God, and there is no God beside me. 
This mystery is symbolical I told in the biblical story of washing the feet of his disciples. It is said that Jesus stripped himself of his clothes, took a towel, and wrapped it around himself. After washing the feet of his disciples, he dried them with the towel around his waist. Peter objected to having his feet washed, and was told that if he did not allow his feet to be washed, he would have no part with Jesus. Peter replied, Lord, not only my feet, but also my hands and my head. Jesus answered, The one who has bathed only needs to wash his feet, but is completely clean. John 13, 1-10. Common sense would tell the reader that a man is not entirely clean just because his feet were washed. Therefore, he should dismiss this story as fanciful or seek its hidden meaning. Every story in the Bible is a psychological drama unfolding in man's consciousness, and this is no exception. This washing of the disciples' feet is the mystical story of spiritual circumcision, or the revelation of the Lord's secrets. Jesus is Khalid the Lord. It is said that the name of the Lord is Hayam, I am the Lord, that is my name. Isaiah 42, 8. The story tells us that Jesus was naked except for a towel covering his loins or secrets. Jesus, or Lord, symbolizes his consciousness of being, whose secrets are concealed by the towel, representing man's consciousness. The foot symbolizes understanding that must be washed of all human beliefs or conceptions of self by the Lord. By removing the towel to dry the feet, the Lord's secrets are revealed. In summary, the elimination of the belief of being a man reveals your consciousness as the head of creation. Chapter 15. Time Interval Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions, otherwise I would have told you. I am going to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. John 14, 13. The me you are to believe in is your consciousness. The I am is God. It is also the Father's house, containing within it all imaginable states of consciousness. Every conditioned state of consciousness is called a mansion. This conversation takes place within yourself. Your I am, the unconditional consciousness, is the Christ speaking to the conditioned ego or the consciousness of John Smith. I am John from a mystical point of view, are two beings, namely Christ and John. Thus, I am going to prepare a place for you means moving from your current state of consciousness to that desired state. It is a promise from your Christ or consciousness of being to your present conception of yourself that you will leave behind to seize upon another. Man is so enslaved by time that if he gains a state of consciousness not yet seen by the world and that desired state is not immediately embodied, he loses faith in his claim not being immediately seen. He abandons it and returns to his previous state of consciousness due to this human limitation. It has been very useful for me to use a specific time interval to undertake this journey to a prepared mansion. We have all catalogued the different days of the week, the months of the year, and the seasons. By this statement, you and I have said time and again, today is like a Sunday or a Monday or a Saturday. We have also said, in the middle of summer, why does it seem and feel like the autumn of the year? This is positive proof that you and I have definite feelings associated with these different days, months, and seasons of the year. Due to this association, we can consciously dwell at any time in that chosen day or season. Do not selfishly define this interval in days and hours, because you are impatient to receive it, but simply remain convinced that it is done, Time being purely relative must be completely eliminated, and your wish will be fulfill eed. This ability to dwell at all times allows us to use time for our journey to the desired abode. Now I, the consciousness, move to a point in time and there I prepare a place. If I go to such a point in time and prepare a place, I will return to that point in time where I left, and I will gather you and take you with me to that place I prepared, so that where I am, you may also be. Let me give you an example of this journey. Suppose you have an intense desire like most time-bound men. You might think you couldn't fulfill such a desire within a limited time frame, but by admitting that all things are possible to God, by believing that God is the I within you or your consciousness of being, you can say like John, I can do nothing, but everything is possible to God, and God I know 
is my consciousness of being. Soon after, how will my desire be fulfilled? I do not know, like John, but by the very law of my being I know it will be so. With this firmly established belief, choose a relative and reasonable interval of time in which this desire could be realized again. Let me remind you not to cut short the time interval, because you are eager to receive your desire. Make it a natural interval. No one can give you the time interval. Only you can say what would be the natural interval for you. Time is relative, meaning no two individuals would give the same measure of time for the fulfillment of their desire. Time is always conditioned by the concept man has of himself. Self-confidence determined by conditioned consciousness always shortens the time interval. If you're accustomed to great accomplishments, you'll give yourself a much shorter interval to realize your desire than the man educated in defeat. If today is Wednesday, and you decide that it would be very possible for your desire to be embodied in a new realization of yourself by Sunday, then Sunday becomes the point in time you would visit to do this. This visit excludes Wednesday and welcomes Sunday. This is done simply by feeling that it is Sunday. Begin to hear the church bell s, start to feel the tranquility of the day and everything that Sunday means to you. Truly feel that it is Sunday. Now, once you have done this, feel the joy of having received what was merely a desire on Wednesday. Feel the complete emotion of having received and then return to Wednesday, the point in time you left behind. By doing this, you have created a vacuum in consciousness by moving from Wednesday to Sunday. Nature, which abhors a vacuum, hastens to fill it, thus creating a mold in the likeness of what you potential EI create, that is, the joy of having realized your defined desire. When you return to Wednesday, you will be filed with joyous anticipation because you have established the consciousness of what is to come the following Sunday. While walking through the interval of Thursday, Friday and Saturday, nothing disturbs you whatever the situation, because you have predetermined what you will be on the day of rest, and that remains an unshakable conviction. After going forward and preparing the place, you return to John and now carry him with you through the three-day interval to the prepared place, so that he may share your joy with you. For where I am you can also be chapter 16, the Trinitarian God. And God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness. Genesis 1.26 Having discovered that God is our consciousness of being, and that this unconditional reality is unchangeable, the I Am is the sole creator. Let's see why the Bible records a trinity as the creator of the world. In verse 26 of the first chapter of Genesis, it is said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness. Churches refer to this plurality of gods as God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, meaning God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. They have never tried to explain it. For you are in the dark about this mystery. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are three aspects or conditions of the unconditional consciousness of being called Ed God. The consciousness of being precedes the consciousness of being something. This unconditional consciousness that precedes our states of consciousness is God. The three conditioned aspects or divisions of self can be better described as foal ows. The receptive attitude of the mind is the aspect that receives impressions and can thus be compared to a womb or a mother. What makes the impression is the masculine or pressing aspect and is therefore known as the father. The impression over time becomes an expression whose expression is always the likeness and image of the impression, which is why this objectified aspect is said to be the son who bears witness to his father-mother. Understanding this mystery of the Trinity allows one who understands it to completely transform his world and configure it as desired. Here is a practical application of this mystery. Sit quietly and decide what you would most like to express or possess. Once you have decided, close your eyes and completely remove your attention from anything that could deny the realization of the desired thing. Then, take a receptive mental attitude and play the game of supposing. By imagining how you would feel if your desire were fulfilled now, begin to listen as if space were speaking to you and telling you that you are now what you wish to be. This receptive state is the state of consciousness you must assume before any impression occurs. When this flexible and impressionable mental state is reached, begin to impress upon yourself 
that you are what you wish to be, affirming and feeling that you now express and possess what you decided to be and have. Continue in this state until the impression is made. By contemplating the fact of being and possessing what you decided to be and possess, you will notice that with each breath a joyful emotion runs through your entire being. This emotion intensifies as you increasingly feel the joy of being what you claim to be. Then, with a final and deep inhalation, your entire being will burst with the joy of realization, and by your feelings, you will know that you are impregnated with God the Father. As soon as the impression occurs, open your eyes and return to the world you closed off a few moments earlier, in that receptive attitude while you contemplated being what you wished to be. In reality, you were performing the spiritual act of generation, so that upon your return from this silent meditation, you are a pregnant being carrying a child or an impression, whose child has been immaculately conceived without the aid of man. Doubt is the only force capable of disturbing the seed or impression. To avoid a miscarriage of such a wondrous child, walk secretly during the interval of time needed, for the impression to become an expression. Do not reveal to anyone your spiritual romance. Keep your secret within you, joyful why, confident and happy, that one day you will give birth to the child of your love, expressing and possessing the nature of your impression. Then you will know the mystery of God who says, Let us make man in our image. You will know that the plurality of God is the one you refer to. They are the three aspects of your own consciousness, and that you are the Trinity united in a spiritual conclave to shape a world in the image and likeness of what you are conscious of being. Chapter 17 Prayer But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father, who is unseen. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you openly. Matthew 6.6 6. Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. Mark 11.24 Prayer is the most wonderful experience a man can have, unlike the daily murmurs of the vast majority of humanity on earth, who with their vain repetitions hope to attract God's attention. Prayer is the ecstasy of a spiritual union that unfolds in the deep and quiet silence of consciousness. In its true sense, prayer is the wedding ceremony of God. Just as a young girl, on her wedding day, relinquishes the name of her family to take the name of her husband. Similarly, one who prays must renounce their current name or nature and take on the nature of what they pray for. The Gospels have clearly instructed man in achieving this ceremony as foal ooze, but when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you openly. Matthew 6-6 six six. Entering inside is entering the bridal chamber, just as no one other than the bride and groom is allowed into a room as sacred as the bridal suite on the night of the wedding ceremony. Similarly, no one else but the one who prays and what they pray for is al owed into the holy hour of prayer. Just as the bride and groom securely close the door against the outside world upon entering the bridal suite, one who enters the holy hour of prayer must shut the door of the senses completely and exclude entirely the world around them. This is done by completely turning away attention from all things other than what one is in love with, the desired thing. The second phase of this spiritual ceremony is defined by these words, Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. By joyfully contemplating being and possessing what you desire to be and have, you have crossed this second stage and thus spiritual eye realize the acts of marriage and generation. Your receptive mental attitude while praying or contemplating can be likened to a bride or womb for it is this aspect of the mind that receives impressions. What you contemplate being is the groom, for it is the name or nature you assume, and thus what leaves its imprint. Thus you rid yourself of singleness or the current nature by adopting the name and nature of the imprint. Lost in contemplation, and having assumed the name and nature of what you contemplate, your entire being is engulfed by the joy of being that, this agitation that runs through your entire being when you become aware of your desire is proof that you are married and impregnated. When returning from this silent meditation, 
The door opens again to the world you left behind. But this time you return as a pregnant bride, entering the world as a changed being. And even if no one else knows anything about this wonderful romance, the world will soon see signs of your pregnancy, for you will start expressing what you felt to be during your hour of silence. The mother of the world or the wife of the Lord, Khaled Mary, or purposeful water, for water loses its identity by adopting the nature of what it mingles with. Similarly, the receptive attitude of the mind must lose its identity by adopting the nature of the desired thing. Only to the extent that one is willing to give up their limitations and current identity can they become what they desire to be. Prayer is the formula by which such divorces and marriages are made. Again, Truly I tell you that if two of you on earth agree about anything they ask for, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. Matthew 18, 19. The two who agree are you, the bride, and the desired thing, the groom. When this agreement is achieved, a child will be born, who will testify to this union. Begin expressing and possessing what you are conscious of being in prayer. Then you will recognize yourself as what you desire to be, instead of praying to God for what you desire. Meal ions of prayers go unanswered daily because man prays to a non-existent God. Being the consciousness of God, one must seek in his consciousness the desired thing by assuming the consciousness of the desired quality. Only when one does that, their prayers will be answered. Being conscious of being poor while praying for wealth will only reward the state of consciousness one is aware of being, which is poverty. Prayers for success must be claimed and appropriated. Embrace the positive consciousness of the desired thing. Once your desire is defined, quietly enter within yourself and close the door behind you. Lose yourself in your desire. Feel as if you are one with it. Remain in that state until you have absorbed the life and name by claiming and feeling that you are and have what you desired. When you come out of your prayer hour, you must be conscious of being and possessing what you desired thus far. The twelve disciples represent the twelve qualities of the mind that can be controlled and disciplined by man. If disciplined, they will at all times obey the command of the one who disciplined them. These twelve qualities in man are the potential of every mind. Undisciplined, their actions resemble more those of a crowd than those of a trained and disciplined army. All storms and confusion surrounding man can be directly attributed to these twelve aisle-related characteristics of the human mind in its current state of numbness. Until they awaken and are disciplined, they will allow any rumor and sensual emotion to shake them. When these twelve are disciplined and placed under control, the one who achieves this control will tell them in the future, I will not call you servants anymore. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. John 15, 15. Know that from now on, every disciplined mental attribute acquired will support and protect you. The names of the twelve qualities reveal their nature. These names are not given to them until they are called ed to be disciples. They are Simon, who was later Khaled Peter, Andrew, James, John, Philip, Bartholomew, Thomas, Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot and Judas, the first quality to call and discipline is Simon, or the attribute of hearing. This faculty, as the level of a disciple rises, allows only impressions that its hearing has ordered to enter into consciousness. Regardless of what human wisdom may suggest, or what the evidence of the senses conveys, if such suggestions and ideas are not in harmony with what it hears, it remains unmoved. It has been instructed by its master and understands that anything it allows to pass through its door will reach its master and teacher. Its consciousness will leave its imprint, which must become over time an expression. Simon's instruction is that he should allow entry into his master's consciousness only to worthy and honorable visitors or impressions. No error can be hidden from his master, for every expression of life tells his master who he has consciously or unconsciously welcomed. When Simon, through his actions, demonstrates to be a true and faithful disciple, he is then named Peter or the Rock. He is the impassive disciple, the one who cannot be corrupted or coerced by any visitor, Khaled by his master, Simon Peter. He who faithful I listens to the commandments of his master and neglects none is this Simon Peter, 
who discovers that I am is the Christ. Thanks to his discovery, he is given the keys to heaven and becomes the cornerstone on which the temple of God rests. Buildings must have strong foundations, and only the disciplined hearing can, upon learning that I am the Christ, remain firm and unshaken in the knowledge that I am the Christ and that there is no Saviour beside me. The second quality to be coloured to discipleship is Andrew, or courage. When the first quality, self-confidence, is developed, the courage of his brother, automatical eye, emerges. Self-confidence, which asks for no one's help but quietly and solitarily appropriates the consciousness of the desired quality, persists despite reason, or senses, conveying contrary messages. It continues to wait faithful why, convinced that its invisible claim, if maintained, will materialize. This faith develops a courage and strength of character that surpass the wildest dreams of undisciplined man, whose faith lies in visible things. The faith of undisciplined man truly cannot be called faith, for if one removes his armies, his medications, or the wisdom of man in which his faith is placed, his faith and courage disappear with it. But for the disciplined, one could take away the whole world. And yet he would remain faithful, knowing that the state of consciousness in which he resides must be embodied in its time. This. Courage is the brother of Peter, Andrew, the disciple who knows how to dare, act, and be silent. The next two, the third and the fourth Carl Ed, are also connected. They are the brothers James and John. James the Just and his brother John the Beloved. Justice to be wise must be administered with love, always turning the other cheek and repaying evil with good, love for hatred, non-violence for violence. The disciple James, symbol of disciplined judgment, must, when elevated to the rank of supreme judge, have blindfolded eyes to not be influenced by the flesh or judge according to appearances of being. Disciplined judgment is administered by someone who is not influenced by appearances. The one who colored these brothers to discipleship remains faithful to his commandment to listen only to what has been ordained to him, which is good. The man who possesses this disciplined quality of the mind is incapable of hearing and accepting as true anything, whether from himself or another, if it does not fill his heart with love when he listens. These two disciples or aspects of the mind are one and inseparable. When this disciplined one awakens, he forgives all men for being what they are, knowing as a wise judge that each man perfectly expresses what he is. As a conscious being, he knows that our manifestation rests on the unchanging foundation of consciousness, that changes in expression can only occur through changes in consciousness. Without condemning or criticizing, these disciplined qualities of the mind allow each to be what he is. However, while they allow this perfect freedom of choice to Allah, they ensure that each professes and acts for himself and others only those things that, when expressed, glorify, dignify and bring joy to the one expressing them. The fifth quality Khaled to discipleship is Philip. He asked to see the Father. The awakened man knows that the Father is the state of consciousness in which man resides, and that this state or Father can only be seen when it is expressed. He knows himself as the perfect resemblance or image of that consciousness to which he identifies. That is why he declares, No one has ever seen my Father except me who was born of him. I have revealed him. John 1.18 If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. And from now on, you know him and have seen him. John 14.7 I have been with you for so long, and you have not known me, Philip. He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words I say to you I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me, I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Otherwise believe me because of the works themselves. John 14, 9, 11. I and my Father, consciousness and its expression, God and man, are one. This aspect of the mind, when disciplined, persists until ideas, ambitions and desires become incarnated realities. It is this quality that asserts, And in my flesh I shall see God. Job 19.26 He knows how to embody the word. John 1.14 How to give form to the formless. The sixth disciple is Carl Ed Bartholomew. 
This quality is the imaginative faculty whose awakened nature distinguishes the individual from the masses. An awakened imagination places the awakened person above the average man, making him appear as a beacon of light in a world of darkness. No quality separates man from man as much as disciplined imagination. It is about separating the wheat from the chaff. Those who have contributed the most to society are our artists, scientists, inventors, and others with great imagination. If one were to investigate to determine why so many seemingly educated men and women fail in the years full owing university, or to determine the reason for the different powers of success of the masses, there is no doubt that imagination has played a significant role. Such an investigation would demonstrate that it is imagination that makes a leader, while its absence makes a follower. Instead of developing man's imagination, our educational system often stifles it by trying to instill in man the wisdom he seeks. It forces him to memorize a series of textbooks that are too quickly contradicted by others later. Education is not accomplished by adding something to man. Its purpose is to draw from man the wisdom that lies dormant within him. Let the reader call Bartholomew to discipleship, for only to the extent that this quality receives to the level of the disciple will, it have the ability to conceive ideas that elevate beyond the limits of man. The seventh is named Thomas. This disciplined quality doubts or denies any noise and suggestion that is not in harmony with what Simon Peter has been commanded to let in. The man conscious of his health does not owe it to heritage, diets, or climate, but because he is awake and knows the state of consciousness in which he lives, he will continue to express health despite the world's conditions. He might hear from the press, radio, and the wise of the world that plague was ravaging the earth and yet remain unmoved and unimpressed. Thomas the skeptic, when disciplined, would deny that disease or anything else not in line with the consciousness to which he belongs has the power to affect him. This quality of denial, when disciplined, protects man from receiving impressions that are not in harmony with his nature. It adopts an attitude day of total indifference to all suggestions that do not align with what he desires to express. Disciplined denial is not a fight, but total indifference. Matthew the Eighth is the gift of God. This quality of the mind reveals man's desires as gifts from God. The man who caled this disciple knows that every desire of his heart is a gift from heaven and contains both the power and the plan of his self-expression. Such a man never questions the form of his expression. He knows that the plan of expression is never revealed to him because the ways of God are unsearchable. Romans 11.13 He fully accepts his desires as gifts already received and walks his path in peace confident that they will appear. The ninth disciple is Collard James, the son of Alphaeus. This is the quality of discernment. A clear and orderly mind is the voice that callous this disciple. This faculty perceives what is not revealed to the human eye. This disciple does not judge by appearances, for he has the ability to function in the realm of causes and is therefore never deceived by appearances. Clairvoyance is the faculty that awakens when this quality is developed and disciplined. It is not the clairvoyance of spiritualism parlors, but true clairvoyance or clear vision of the mystic, meaning the ability to see what is interpreted. Discernment or the ability to diagnose is the quality of James the son of Alpheus. Thaddeus the tenth is the disciple of praise. This is a quality sadly lacking in undisciplined man. When this quality of praise and gratitude awakens in man, he walks with the words. Thank you, Father, always on his lips. He knows that his gratitude for unseen things opens the windows of heaven and all our gifts that go beyond his capacity to receive. The man who does not give thanks for what he has received will probably not receive many gifts from the same source. Until this quality of the mind is disciplined, the man will not see the desert bloom like the rose. Praise and acknowledgement are to the invisible gifts of God what rain and sunshine are to the invisible seeds in the womb of the earth. The eleventh quality Khaled Simon the Canaanite, a good catchphrase for this disciple, is hearing the good news. Simon the Canaanite, or Simon from the land of milk and honey when Khaled to discipleship, is evidence that the one calling this faculty is conscious of abundant life. He can say with the psalmist, David, You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. 
You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Psalms 23.5 This disciplined aspect of the mind is incapable of hearing anything but good news, hence well qualified to preach the gospel or good news. The twelfth and final of the disciplined aspects of the mind is Caled Judas. When this quality is awakened, the man knows that he must die to what he is before he can become what he desires to be. That is why it is said that this disciple committed suicide, which is the mystic's way of telling the initiates that Judas is the disciplined aspect of detachment. He knows that his I am, or his consciousness, is his saviour, so he lets go of all other saviours. This quality, when disciplined, gives the individual the strength to let go. The man who invoked Judas has learned to divert his attention from problems or limitations and focus on what is the solution or the savior. Unless one is born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. John 3.3 3. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. No one has greater love than this, to lay down his life for his friends. John 15.13 When the man realizes that the desired quality, if embodied, would save him and make him a friend, he will ingly gives up his present conception of himself for his friend, detaching his consciousness from what he is aware of being, and assuming the consciousness of what he desires to be. Judas, whom the world in its ignorance has obscured, will become, when man awakens from his undisciplined state, the one placed above, because God is love and there is no greater love than this to lay down one's life for a friend. Until the man gets rid of what he is presently conscious of, he will not become what he desires to be, and Judas is the one who achieves this through suicide or detachment. These are the twelve qualities given to man within the framework of the world. Man's duty is to raise them to the level of discipleship. When this is accomplished, man will say, I have accomplished the work you gave me to do. I have glorified you on earth, and now, O Father, glorify me with your own glory, the glory that I had with you before the world existed. John 17, 45. Chapter 19. Liquid Light. For in him we live and move and have our being. Acts 17, 28. Psychical why. This world resembles an ocean of light containing all things within it, including man, as pulsating bodies enveloped in liquid light. The biblical story of the flood, Genesis 6, 8, is the state in which man lives. Man is truly immersed in an ocean of liquid light where countless luminous beings move about. The story of the flood is playing out today. Man is the ark that contains within him the masculine or feminine principles of all life. The dove or the idea sent in search of dry land is man's attempt to embody his ideas. Man's ideas resemble birds in flight, like the dove in the story that returns to man without finding a resting place. If man is not discouraged by these fruitless searches, one day the bird will return with a green twig. After assuming the consciousness of what is desired, man will be convinced that it is so and will feel he possesses what he has consciously appropriated, even if his senses do not yet confirm it. One day, man will identify so completely with his conception that he will know he is the same and will declare, I am, I am what I desire to be, I am the one who is. He will discover that in doing so, he will begin to embody his desire. The dove or the desire will find dry land this time, thus realizing the mystery of the word made flesh. I am the light of the world. John 8, 12, John 9, 5, John 12, 46. Your consciousness of being is the crystallized liquid light of the world, crystallized in the conceptions you have of yourself. Your unconditional consciousness of being was first conceived in liquid light, which is the initial speed of the universe. All things from the highest vibrations to the lowest are different vibrations of this initial speed. Gold, silver, iron, wood, flesh, etc. are only different expressions or speeds of this singly substance liquid light. All things are crystal isid out of liquid light. Differentiation or the infinity of expression is caused by the conceiving desire to know itself. Your conception of yourself automatical I determines the speed necessary to express what you have conceived to be. The world is an ocean of liquid light in countless states of crystallization. 
Chapter 20 The Breath of Life Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. Genesis 2 7. You do not know the way of the wind or how the bones grow in the womb of the pregnant woman. Likewise, you do not know the works of God who makes all things. After this, the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, fell ill, and his illness was so severe that he breathed no more. Kings 17.17 17. And Elisha went up, lay on the child, put his mouth on his mouth, his eyes on his eyes, his hands on his hands, and he stretched himself upon the child, and the flesh of the child became warm. 2 Kings 4.34 but after the three and a half days, the breath of life from God entered them, and they stood up, and great fear fell on those who saw them. Revelation 11, 11. Truly, the prophet Elijah or Elisha revived the dead son of the widow. This story, like all other stories in the Bible, is a psychological drama unfolding in man's consciousness. The widow symbolizes all men and women of the world, and the dead child represents the frustrated desires and ambitions of man, while the prophet Elijah symbolizes the power of God within man or man's consciousness of being. The story tells us that the prophet took the dead child from the widow's bosom, took him into an upper room, closed the door behind them, and placed the child on a bed. He breathed life into him, then returned the child to his mother, saying, Woman, your son is alive. Look, your son lives. Pres. Kings 17.23 and 2 Kings 4.36. Man's desires can be symbolized by the dead child. The mere fact that you desire is positive proof that the desired thing is not yet a living reality in your world. You try by every conceivable means to bring the realities of desires to life, but in the end, you find that all attempts are fruitless. Most men are not aware of the existence of infinite power within themselves. Like the prophet, they indefinitely remain with a dead child in their arms, unaware that desire is the positive indication of unlimited capacities for its fulfillment. When man recognizes that his consciousness is a prophet breathing life into everything he is aware of being, he will close the door of his senses to his problem and focus his attention solely on what he desires, knowing that in doing so, his desires will certainly be realized. You will discover that acknowledgement is the breath of life, for by consciously affirming that you now express or possess everything you desire to be or have, you will breathe the breath of life into your desire. The quality claimed by desire recognized by you will begin to move and become a living reality in your world. Thus, the prophet Elijah lives eternal. He has man's unlimited consciousness of being, the widow as his limited consciousness of being, and the child as what he desires to be. Chapter 21. Daniel in the Lion's Den. Your God, whom you serve continual why, will deliver you. Daniel 6.16. The story of Daniel is the story of every man. It is said that Daniel, while confined in the lion's den, turned his back on the hungry beasts and, with his eyes fixed on the light from above, prayed to the one God. The lions, hungry for a feast, remained powerless to harm the prophet. Daniel's faith in God was so great that he eventually gained his freedom and was appointed to a high position in the government of his country. Daniel 6, 13-28 This story was written for you, to instruct you in the art of freeing yourself from any problem or prison in the world. Most of us, finding ourselves in the lion's den, would worry only about the lions, thinking of no other problem in the world than that of the lions. However, we are told that Daniel turned his back on them and looked toward the light which was God. If we could follow Daniel's example when threatened by any dire disaster like the lions, poverty, or illness, if, like Daniel, we could turn our attention toward the light which is God, our solutions would be just as simple. For instance, if you were imprisoned, no one would need to tell you that what you should desire is freedom. Freedom, or rather the desire to be free, would be automatic. The same would go if you were sick, in debt, or faced with any other difficulty. The lions represent seemingly insoluble situations of a threatening nature. Every problem automatical I produces its solution in the form of a desire to be free of the problem. Therefore, turn away from your problem and focus on the desired solution. 
already feeling yourself to be what you desire. Continue with this belief, and you will discover that the wall of your prison will disappear as you begin to express what you are conscious of being. I have seen people seemingly and irretrievably in debt apply this principle, and in a very short time, enormous debts were eliminated. I have also seen individuals whom doctors had declared incurable apply this principle, and their supposedly incurable illness vanished in an incredibly short time, leaving no trace. Consider your desires as words spoken by God and every word of prophecy about what you are capable of being. Do not question whether you are worthy or unworthy of achieving these desires. Accept them as they come to you, and thank them as if they were gifts. Feel happy and grateful to have received such wonderful gifts, then go on your way in peace. This simple acceptance of your desires is like the dropping of a fertile seed into ever-ready soil. When you drop your desire into consciousness as a seed, confident that it will appear in its full potential, you have done all that is expected of you. Worrying or being anxious about how it unfolds holds these fertile seeds in a mental grip, thus preventing them from truly ripening into their full harvest. Do not concern yourself with results. Results will come as surely as day follows night. Have faith in this process until you see proof that it is so. Your faith in this seed will bring you great rewards. Just wait a little until suddenly, and when you least expect it, the felt thing becomes your expression in the consciousness of the desired thing. Life makes no exceptions for people and destroys nothing. It continues to keep alive what man is conscious of being. Things will only vanish when man changes his consciousness. Deny them, if you will. The fact remains that consciousness is the only reality, and things are only the reflection of what you are conscious of being. The heavenly state you seek will be found only in consciousness, for the kingdom of heaven is within you. Your consciousness is the only living reality, the eternal head of creation. What you are conscious of being is the temporary body you wear. To turn your attention away from what you are conscious of being is to decapitate this body. But just as a chicken or a snake continues to jump and wriggle for a while after being decapitated, likewise, qualities and conditions seem to live for a while after your attention has turned away from them. Man, unaware of this law of consciousness, continues to revolve around his previous usual conditions and pay attention to them, thereby placing the eternal head of creation back on these dead bodies reviving and resurrecting them. Leave these corpses in peace and let the dead bury the dead. Matthew 8.22, Luke 9.60 Man, after putting his hand to the plough, that is, after assuming the consciousness of the desired quality, can only look back for the kingdom of heaven. Luke 9.62 As the wheel of heaven is always done on earth, you are now in the heaven you have established within yourself, because here, on this very earth, your heaven reveals itself. The kingdom of heaven is truly near now. This is the accepted time. Therefore, create a new heaven, enter into a new state of consciousness, and a new earth will appear. Chapter 22. The Fishing They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. John 21.3. Cast the net on the right side of the boat and you will find. So they cast it and they were not able to haul it in because of the quantity of fish. John 21.6 It is said that the disciples fished all night and caught nothing. Then Jesus appeared on the scene and told them to cast their nets again, but this time on the other side. Peter obeyed Jesus' voice and cast the nets back into the water, where a moment earlier the water was completely devoid of fish. The nets almost broke under the weight of the catch. John 21.3.6 Man, fishing all night in human ignorance, tries to realize his desires through effort and struggle, only to find in the end that his quest is in vain. When man discovers that his consciousness of being is the Christ, he will obey its voice and let that voice direct his fishing. He will cast his hook on the right side, apply the law rightly, and seek in consciousness the desired thing. When he finds it, he will know it will multiply in the world of form. Those who have enjoyed fishing know how exciting it is to feel the fish bite the hook. The touch of the fish is full owed by the play of the fish, and this play is in turn full owed by landing the fish. 
Something similar happens in the consciousness of man when he fishes for the manifestations of life. Fishermen know that if they want to catch big fish, they must fish in deep waters. If you want to catch a great measure of life, you must leave behind the Shalau waters with their many reefs and barriers and cast into the blue and deep waters where the big fish play. Here is a simple formula for successful fishing. First, decide what you want to express or possess. This is crucial. You must know clearly what you want in life before you can fish for it. Once you have made your decision, withdraw from the world of the senses. Turn your attention away from the problem and focus it simply on the fact of being. By silently but convincingly repeating, I am, as your attention moves away from the surrounding world and settles on the I am, losing yourself in the sensation of simply being, you will find that you are lifting the anchor that held you down in your problem, effortlessly finding yourself heading into the depths. The sensation accompanying this act is one of expansion. You will feel as if you are rising and expanding as if growing. Do not fear this experience of floating and growing, for you are dying only to your limitations. However, your limitations will die as you move away from them, because they live only in your consciousness. In this deep or expanded consciousness, you will feel like a powerful pulsating force, as deep and rhythmic as the ocean. This expanded feeling is the sign that you are now in the deep blue waters where the big fish swim. Suppose the fish you have decided to catch are health and freedom. You begin fishing in this throbbing depth, formless, of yourself, these qualities or states of consciousness by feeling, I am healthy, I am free. Continue to claim and feel your health and freedom until the conviction that you are envelops you. When conviction arises within you and all doubts disappear, you will know and feel that you are free from the limitations of the past. You will know that you have caught these fish. The joy that runs through your entire being in feeling that you are what you wanted to be equals the excitement of the fisherman when he catches his fish. But the play of the fish is obtained by returning to the world of the senses. When you open your eyes to the surrounding world, the conviction and consciousness of being healthy and free must be established in you in such a way that your entire being thrills with anticipation. Then, as you traverse the interval of time required for the felt things to embody themselves, you will feel a secret thrill, knowing that what you alone sense and know to be will soon materialize. At a moment when you least think, while finally advancing in this consciousness, you will begin to express and possess what you are conscious of, and in taking possession, Experience with the fisherman the joy of landing the big fish. Now, go fish for the manifestation of life by casting the nets on the right side. The son of man, the idea you want to manifest, is constantly destroyed by the hand of man, by explanation or rational wisdom. Now that your consciousness is revealed as the cause of all expression, do not return to the darkness of Egypt with its many gods. There is only one God, the only God is your consciousness, and all the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing. But he acts according to his while in the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth, and no one can stop his hand or question what you are doing. If everyone were to agree that a thing could not be expressed, and yet you were to become conscious of being that thing they agreed was unattainable, would you express it? Your consciousness never asks permission to express what you are conscious of. It does so naturally and effortlessly, despite human wisdom and all opposition. Do not greet anyone on the way, do not carry a purse, bag or shoes, and do not greet anyone on the way. Luke 10, 4, Kings 4, 29. This is not an order to be insolent or unfriendly, but a reminder not to recognize anyone as superior, not to see any person as a barrier to your expression. No one can stop your hand or question your ability to express what you are conscious of, do not judge according to the appearance of a thing, for everything is considered nothing in God's eyes. All nations are like nothing before him. They are regarded by him as less than nothing and worthless. Isaiah 40 per 17 When the disciples, through their judgment based on appearances, saw the lunatic child Mark 9, 17 to 29, they thought it was a more difficult problem to solve than others they had seen, and that's why they couldn't heal him. Judging by appearances, they forgot that all things are possible to God, Matthew 19, 26, Mark 10, 27. 
Hypnotized as they were by the reality of appearances, they could not feel the naturalness of wisdom. The only way to avoid these failures is to constantly keep in mind that your consciousness is all-powerful, the omniscient presence. Unaided, this unknown presence within you, natural why emits what you are conscious of. Be perfectly indifferent to the evidence of the senses to natural why feel your desire, and your desire will be fulfilled. Turn away from appearances and feel the naturalness of this perfect perception within you, a quality in which you should never lack confidence or doubt. Its understanding will never lead you astray. Your desire is the solution to your problem. When desire is fulfilled, the problem dissolves. Nothing can be forced outward with the greatest effort of will. There is only one way to command the things you want, and that is by assuming the consciousness of the desired things. There is a vast difference between feeling something and merely knowing it, intellectual why. You must unreservedly accept the fact that in possessing that is feeling a thing in your consciousness, you have ordered the reality that causes it to exist in concrete form. You must be absolutely convinced of an unbroken connection between the invisible reality and its visible manifestation. Your inner acceptance must become an intense and unshakable conviction that transcends both reason and intel ik. By completely abandoning our belief in the reality of externalization, except as a reflection of an inner state of consciousness, when you truly understand and believe these things, you will have built a certainty so deep that nothing can shake it. Your desires are the invisible realities that respond only to the commands of God. God commands the invisible to appear by affirming that He Himself is the thing ordered, Philippians 2-6. Now, let this statement sink deep into your ear. Be conscious of being what you want to appear. But very few can read a financial statement. The ability to interpret a financial statement is a sign of clear vision or clairvoyance. Every object, animate, or inanimate, is enveloped in a liquid light that moves and pulsates with an energy far more radiant than the objects themselves. No one knows this better than the author, but he also knows that the ability to see such auras is not equal to the ability to understand what one sees in the world around us. To illustrate this point, here is a story that everyone knows but only the true mystic or clairvoyant has actual why seen. Synopsis the story of Count of Monte Cristo by Dumas is, for the true mystic and clairvoyant, the biography of every man. Edmond Dante, a young sailor, discovers the captain of his ship dead. Taking command of the ship in the midst of a storm-tossed sea, he tries to steer the ship towards safe anchorage. Commentary. Life itself is a sea tossed by storms against which man struggles when trying to steer toward a port of rest. Upon arriving at the port, Three men who, through their flattery and praise, have managed to gain the sympathy of the current king, fearing any change that might alter their positions in government, have the young sailor arrested and imprisoned in the catacombs. Commentary. Man in his quest for security in this world is deceived by the false lights of greed, vanity and power. Most men think that fame, great wealth or political power will protect them from life's storms. Thus they seek to acquire them as anchors of their lives, only to find gradual eye that in their pursuit of these things they lose the knowledge of their true being. If man places his faith in things other than himself, that faith will eventually destroy him, and he will find himself a prisoner of confusion and despair. Here in this tomb, Dante is forgotten and abandoned to his fate for many years. One day, becoming a living skeleton, he hears a knock on his wall. Responding to this knock, he hears someone's voice on the other side of the stone. In response to this voice, Dante removes the stone and discovers an old priest who has been imprisoned for so long that no one knows the reason for his imprisonment or the duration of his captivity. Commentary Behind these wells of mental darkness, man remains in what seems to be a living death. After years of disappointment, man breaks away from these false friends and rediscovers within himself the ancient state of consciousness that has been buried since the day he first believed he was a man and forgot that he was God. The old priest had spent many years digging his way out of this living tomb, only to discover that he had ended his way in Dante's tomb. So he accepts his fate and decides to find his joy and freedom 
in instructing Dante on everything he knows about the mysteries of life and helping him escape as well. Initial Y, Dante is eager to acquire all this information, but the old priest, with infinite patience acquired through his long imprisonment, shows Dante how incapable he is of receiving this knowledge in his current unprepared and anxious state. Thus, with philosophical calmness, he slowly reveals to the young man the mysteries of life and time. Commentary. This revelation is so wonderful that when a man hears it for the first time, he wants to acquire it immediately. But he discovers that after countless years spent believing himself to be a man, he has so forgotten his true identity that he is unable to absorb this memory all at once. He also finds that he can only do so in proportion to his detachment from all human values and opinions. As Dante matures under the old priest's instructions, he increasingly finds himself alive within Dante's consciousness. Eventual why, he imparts his last bit of wisdom to Dante, making him fit for positions of trust. He then speaks of an inexhaustible treasure, buried on the island of Monte Cristo. Commentary As man abandons these precious human values, he absorbs more and more light, the old priest, until he final I becomes the light, and knows, I am the light of the world. Faced with this revelation, the catacomb wall as that separated them from the ocean coal apse, crushing the old man to death. The guards, discovering the accident, sew the old priest's body into a bag and prepare to throw it into the sea. When they step out to fetch a stretcher, Dante removes the old priest's body and sews himself into the sack, the guards unaware of this body switch and believing it to be the old man, toss it into the water. Commentary the flow of blood and water upon the death of the old priest is akin to the flow of blood and water from the side of Jesus when the Roman soldiers pierced him, a phenomenon that always occurs at birth. Here it symbolizes the birth of a higher consciousness. Dante frees himself from the sack, goes to the island of Monte Cristo, and discovers the buried treasure. Then, armed with this fabulous wealth and superhuman wisdom, he sheds his human identity as Edmund Dantes, and assumes the title of Count of Monte Cristo. Commentary. Man discovers that his consciousness of being is the inexhaustible treasure of the universe. On this day when man makes this discovery, he dies as a man and awakens as God. Thus Edmond Dante becomes the Count of Monte Cristo, the man becomes the Christ. Chapter 25, Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want commentary. My consciousness is my Lord and my shepherd. What I am conscious of being are the sheep that follow me. My good shepherd is my consciousness of being, which has never lost a sheep or a thing I am conscious of. My consciousness is a voice calling in the desert of human confusion, calling everything I am conscious of to follow me. My shepherd knows my sheep. My voice has never ceased to respond to my call, and there will never come a time when what I am convinced of will cease to find me. My consciousness of being is the Lord and Shepherd of my life. Now I know I will never need proof or lack proof of what I am conscious of being. Knowing this, I will be conscious of being great, loving, rich, healthy and all other attributes I admire. It is always tightly held and shaken. 3. He leads me beside the steel waters. Commentary. There is no need to struggle for what I am conscious of being. For everything I am conscious of being will be led to me as easily as a shepherd leads his flock to the calm waters of a spring. 4. He restores my soul, he guides me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Commentary. Now that my memory has been restored too. Know that I am the Lord and outside of me there is no God. My kingdom has been restored. My kingdom that disintegrated on the day I believed in power. That part of me is now fully restored. Now that I know my consciousness of being is God, I will make good use of this knowledge by becoming conscious of being what I desire to be. 5. Even though I walk through the veil eye of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and staff comfort me. Commentary. So, even as I walk through all the confusion and changing opinions of men, I will fear no evil, for I have discovered that consciousness is the one that creates confusion, having restored in my own case the place and dignity that belongs to it despite the confusion, 
I will manifest what I am now conscious of being, and that same Confucian will echo and reflect my own dignity. 6. You set a table before me in the presence of my enemies, you anoint my heat with oil, my coop overflows. Commentary. Face it with apparent opposition and conflict. I will succeed because I will continue to manifest the abundance I am now conscious of being. My head, consciousness, will always overflow with the joy of being God. 7. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Commentary Now that I am conscious of being good and merciful, the signs of goodness and mercy are bound to fall on me all the days of my life, for I will continue to dwell in the house or consciousness of being God forever. Chapter 26 The Garden of Olives Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to the disciples, Sit here while I go over there and pray. Matthew 26, 36 In the story of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, a most wonderful mystical tale is told. But man has not seen the light of its symbolism and has misinterpreted this mystical union as an agonizing experience where Jesus begged in vain for his father to change his fate. Gethsemane is for the mystic the garden of creation, the place of consciousness where man is going to realize his defined objectives. Gethsemane is a compound word meaning to press an oily substance, get, express, and x-men, an oily substance. The story of Gethsemane reveals to the mystic in dramatic symbolism the act of creation, just as man contains within himself an oily substance that, in the act of creation, is pressed into an image of himself. Thus he has within him a divine principle, his consciousness, which conditions itself as a state of consciousness, and without aid he presses or objectifies a garden, a cultivated ground, a special Y-prepared field where the gardener chooses the seeds. Gethsemane is such a garden, the place in consciousness where the mystic goes with his clearly defined objectives. One enters this garden when man turns his attention away from the surrounding world and directs it towards his objectives. The clarified desires of man are seeds containing the power and plans of self-expression. And just as the seeds inside man, these are also buried in an oily substance, a joyful and thankful mental attitude, when man contemplates being and possessing what he wishes to be and possess, he initiates the process of pressing, or the spiritual act of creation. These seeds are pressed and planted. When man loses himself in a wild and joyous state by feeling and consciously claiming what he previously desired to be, the expressed or pressed desires result in the realization of that particular desire. Man cannot possess a thing and at the same time desire to possess it. Thus, when one consciously appropriates the feeling of being the desired thing, that desire to become the thing is fulfill ed. The receptive attitude of the mind to feel and receive the impression of being the desired thing is the fertile soil or womb that receives the seed of a defined objective. The seed extracted from a man grows into the likeness of the man from whom it was extracted. Similarly, the mystical seed your conscious affirmation of being what you wish to be thus far will grow in your image and resemble yourself. It is in the garden of Gethsemane, the cultivated garden of the novel, where the disciplined man presses the seeds of joy, parentheses, defined desires outside himself in his receptive attitude of mind. There he cherishes and nurtures them by consciously walking in the joy of being everything he previously desired. He feels with the great gardener the secret thrill of knowing that things and qualities not yet seen will soon be manifested as soon as these conscious impressions grow and ripen. Your consciousness is the Lord and the husband, Isaiah 54, 5. The state of consciousness in which you dwell is the wife or the beloved. This visible state is your child testifying of you its father and mother, for your visible world is made in the image and likeness, Genesis 2:26. From the state of consciousness in which you live, your world and its fullness are nothing more and nothing less than your defined objectified consciousness. Knowing this to be true, ensure to choose wisely the mother of your children, this conscious state in which you live, your conception of yourself. The wise man chooses his wife with great care, 
realizing that his children must inherit the qualities of their parents, so he devotes much time and attention to the choice of his mother. The mystic knows that the conscious state in which he lives is the choice he has made for a spouse, the mother of his children, that this state must ultimately be embodied in his world. That's why he's always selective in his choices and always claims his highest ideal, consciously defining himself as what he desires to be. When man realizes that the conscious state in which he lives is the choice of a partner, he is more cautious with his moods and feelings. He will not all owe himself to react to suggestions of fear, lack, or any undesirable impressions. Such suggestions of lack could never escape the watchful eye of the disciplined mind of the mystic, for he knows that every conscious claim must express itself in due course as a condition of his world, his environment. Thus he remains faithful to his beloved, to his defined objective, by defining, claiming, and feeling to be what he wishes to express. He was placed in a tomb where he remained all Saturday. When the new state of consciousness appropriates itself so that you feel firmly and secure in the knowledge that it is finished, then you will also cry, it is finished, and you will enter the tomb or the Sabbath an interval of time where you will walk imperturbably in the conviction that your new consciousness must resurrect, become visible. Easter, the day of resurrection, fell s on the first Sunday after the fuel moon in Aries. The mystic reason for this is simple. A defined area will not manifest as rain until that area has reached its saturation point. Similarly, the state in which you dwell will not express itself until the whole is imbued with the consciousness that this is how it is finished. Your defined objective is the imaginary state, just as the equator is the imaginary line the sun must cross to mark the beginning of spring. This state, like the moon, has neither light nor life in itself, but will reflect the light of consciousness or the sun. I am the light of the world. Matthew 5.14, John 8.12, John 9-5, John 12.46 I am the resurrection and the life. John 11.25 Just as Easter is determined by the fuel moon in Aries, the resurrection of your conscious affirmation is determined by the fuel consciousness of your affirmation to actualize live as this new conception. Most men fail to resurrect their objectives because they do not remain faithful to their new defined state until it reaches fullness. If man took into account the fact that there can be no Easter or Resurrection Day except after the full moon, he would realize that the state to which he has consciously passed will express itself or resurrect only after dwelling in the state of being his defined objective until his whole being trembles, with the feeling of truly being his conscious claim to live consciously in that state of being. And only in this way will man resurrect or realize his desire. Chapter 27. The Formula for Victory Every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that have I given unto you, Joshua 13. Most people know the story of Joshua capturing the city of Jericho. What they do not know is that this story is the perfect formula for victory in any circumstance and against our odds. It is said that Joshua was armed only with the knowledge that every place he set the sole of his foot would be given to him, whether he desired to capture or tread upon the city of Jericho, but he found that the wail of separating him from the city were insurmountable. To Joshua it seemed physically impossible to breach these enormous wall s and tread upon the city of Jericho. However, he was propelled by the promise that despite the obstacles, if he ever stood above the city, it would be given to him. The book of Joshua also records that instead of wrestling with this massive problem of the wall s, Joshua used the services of Rahab and sent her as a spy into the city. When Rahab entered her house, which was in the midst of the city, Joshua, well protected by Jericho's impassable Wales, sounded the trumpet seven times. At the seventh sound the Wales coal apsed, and Joshua victoriously entered the city. To the uninitiated, this story makes no sense if seen more as a psychological drama than a historical record. However, it is revelatory. If we were to follow Joshua's example, our victory would be just as simple. Joshua symbolizes for you, the reader, your current state. The city of Jericho symbolizes your desire or defined objective. Jericho's wireless symbol is the barriers between you and the fulfillment of your objectives. 
the foot symbolizes understanding. Placing the sole of the foot on a defined place indicates fixing a defined psychological state. Rahab the spy represents your ability to travel secretly or psychological VI to any point in space. Consciousness knows no boundaries. No one can prevent you from psychological why inhabiting any point or state of time or space, regardless of the physical barriers, separating you from your goal. Effortlessly and without anyone's help, you can annihilate time, space, and barriers. Thus, you can psychological eye inhabit the desired state even if you cannot physical eye tread upon it. By saying you can tread upon it, psychological why, I mean that you can now, at this moment, close your eyes and, after visualizing or imagining a place or state different from the present, actually feel that you are now in that place or state. You can feel that this condition is so real that upon opening your eyes, you will be surprised to find that you are not physically there. As you know, give to all men what they ask. Rahab symbolizes your infinite capacity to psychological, I assume, any desirable state, without asking yourself whether you are physical why or moral why fit to do so today. You can capture the modern city of Jericho, or the goal you have set if you psychological I revisit this story of Joshua, but to capture the city and achieve your desires, you must careful I fall out the formula for victory as laid out in this book of Joshua. Here is the application of this victorious formula as revealed today by a modern mystic. First, define your objective, not the way to obtain it, but your objective simply. You must know exactly what you want to have a clear mental image. Second, turn away your attention from the obstacles separating you from your objective and focus on the objective itself. Third, close your eyes and feel that you are already in the city or state you are going to capture. Maintain this psychological state until you feel a conscious reaction of complete satisfaction for this victory. Then, simply by reopening your eyes, return to your previous conscious state. This secret journey to the desired state, with its subsequent psychological reaction of complete satisfaction, is all that is required to achieve total victory. This victorious psychic state will materialize despite any opposition. It has the plan and power of self-expression. From this point, follow the example of Joshua, who, after remaining psychologically in the desired state until feeling a complete conscious reaction of victory, did nothing else to obtain this victory than sound his trumpet seven times. The seventh sound symbolizes the seventh day, a time of calm or rest, the interval between subjective and objective states, a period of gestation or joyful anticipation. This calm is not that of the body but of the mind, a perfect passivity that is not indolence but a living calm that arises from trust in this immutable law of consciousness. Those unfamiliar with this law or formula for victory, in trying to quiet their minds, only acquire a quiet tension that is nothing, but compressed anxiety. But you who know this law will find that after capturing the psychological state that would belong to you if you were already victorious and truly entrenched in that city, you will move towards the physical realization of your desires. You will do this without doubts or fears, in a state of mind fixed on the knowledge of an already established victory. You will not fear the enemy because the outcome was determined by the psychological state preceding the physical offensive, and all the forces of heaven and earth cannot stop the victorious realization of that state. Remain quiet in the defined psychological state as your objective until you feel the emotion of victory. Then, with the confidence born of the knowledge of this law, watch the physical realization of your objective and step forward. Remain calm and watch the law's deliverance with you. Thank you very much for your visit.